are standing on our feet, I, on our feet, let's open to Jeremiah 17. I'll read from cha chapter 17, verse 5. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Blessed is the man who trusts in, uh, cursed is the man who trusts in man, and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert. And shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places in the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream, and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart, and test the mind, and give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Let me pray. God, thank you for your grace and mercy over, over our hearts. Bless your word, bless your truth, so, so that your name will be proclaimed. Prepare our hearts to hear your word. Proclaim your truth to our minds, we oftentimes are so self-focused. Teach us, lead us, let your name be glorified. Amen. You guys may be seated. Let's see. So we started a series um, in our church because we finished Genesis, right? Uh, well, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and we started a series entitled Change and Growth, and last Sunday. And our main goal in this series till, you know, the Christmas series and then, and then January we'll start a new book, is to answer the question, how do we change? How does a Christian change? How do we become more like Christ? Where does this true change come from? Or how do I fight sin? In what ways do I fight it? How do I become like Christ? And as we are going through these series, just like a side note, um, it, it is very helpful to get a hold of a book entitled How People Change. That's, that's actually been one of the motivations for this series. If you have a chance, it would be great for you to purchase this book, How People Change by Timothy Lane and Paul Tripp. A lot of the series will be based on that. Um, so if you're actually listening to it and then you're in the group discussing it and reading it, that's like bonus points. And totally you're going to be changing, probably. Um, so it's, I think it's a good thing to, to read. Last time, Andre started out this session or this series with the point uh, that the, the true change only happens in Jesus Christ. He started with a starting point, you know. In the whole process of change, we need to not forget and not to miss the centrality of change, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation, he's the focus, and he's the fuel of true change. So he presented the heart of the journey of change or for change. And today, in this journey for change, we will step back and we will try to look at this whole process of change through a bird's eye view, to see it over as an overview, to see, to see how do people change, not just specific details, but the whole process of change. And then sermons following this will focus specifically on every point. And so if you don't know... You don't have to understand everything about every point, but just understand the general picture. The, the, the simple answer is we're giving you the map before you start the journey to see where do you, do you go and where do you turn. When we don't realize that there are various pieces at play for this journey, we become ineffective in growth and change. You can't fix a crack in the ceiling without knowing the whole structure. How does the, the roof work? How does the structure work? And then you can fo focus on figuring out how this crack, how to solve this. You can't help a ticking engine, right? A sound, a unique sound in the engine without knowing all its parts, 
all it, how they work together, and then you can know how to fix it. You can't win a chess game without knowing how each piece works. You can't even play it without knowing how they work. So in order for you to be good at any of them, you have to know the whole picture. So it is true in our growth and change of Christ. We cannot change without seeing ourselves in light of the Bible, without seeing what are the various parts, what are the important parts for me to change on this journey. So for example, if you're battling a particular sin, right, or having a hard time with, you know, with, with laziness, anger, frustration, Oftentimes you can ask, how do I battle that sin? What do I do? How do I grow out of that? Oftentimes the advice that we get or tell ourselves is just stop it. Stop doing it. Stop desiring. Stop going there. If you have a drinking problem, stop going to the stores and don't buy those drinks. If you have a pornography problem, put a lock on your computer because that will help it. If you have a problem with anger, well, you have to love. If you have a problem for forgiving someone, well, Jesus tells you to forgive, so just forgive. You know, these answers, you know, they're, they forget or do not see the whole picture. They don't understand that the heart does not just change. You can't just stop it. The heart is a complex organism with various parts to it. We may not connect ourselves to those answers. But if you consider a particular sin in your life, um, how do you battle it? How do you change? Is it oftentimes a change in circumstances? Like, you know, when you, this often happens with many people, when you are in a conversation and it becomes heated and you're like, just let's stop this conversation because it's going nowhere. Does that solve the context or we're trying to change the circumstances? It's like, you know, a child is very angry and you just give him a lollipop. Are you helping the child change or are you just covering it up? Is it not telling yourself that from now on, I'll be a better person? Now, you know, it's like the resolutions on the new year. Okay, I'm going to start going to the gym. I'm going to eat better, you know. And oftentimes in our Christian life, when we finish listening to a sermon or, you know, a Bible talk, we, okay, we're pumped up, we're going to do it now. And we realize that that doesn't happen. That's basically telling yourself, just stop doing what you were doing. In order for us to really change and really see fruit, in order for us to really battle sin, we need to understand a bigger process. We need to understand what the Bible speaks about us as people. How do we actually change? In Jeremiah, this is a, a, a great passage that points to various facets of change. Actually, the, the change that happens in our hearts is actually a bigger, like a bigger story of our life. This passage just captures it really well in simple points. If you notice in Jeremiah 17, the context of this passage is God is is speaking to the nation of Judah about their sins. Because in this time of history of Judah, they're, they're not doing so great. Israel is almost conquered. Judah is in this phase. Like God, God is basically telling them he's going to judge them, and they're going to experience his wrath. Um, and then we come to the, our passage. And God is as if forgets Judah for a second and just points to a concept, an idea. He points to an idea why Judah's going to fall. Why are they going to wither away? And the main emphasis in this whole passage is because they left the Lord, because they're not trusting the Lord. And because they're not trusting the Lord, they will destroy themselves in this desert. If you notice, there are a couple of pieces at play here. There are two different people depicted as trees. Both of them live in the desert under scorching heat. One of them does not trust the Lord, but trusts himself or trusts other people. And as a result, he withers away in the heat of the sun. He's going to be like a, a thorn bush. Yet there's another person who does trust the Lord. And in his trust, the passage elaborates that his roots go to the water. 
His roots go to the streams of water. And no matter the sun, the desert impact on his life, this person is able to bring fruit. So the whole point of this passage is without the Lord, there is no way to survive. Because all people live in the desert. And then he concludes this passage with an emphasis on the heart to show that the people don't have a good heart. They have a sinful heart. So this passage brings out important principles or important elements of this map of change. So the first thing that we see that we have to outline is we live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. Notice that both trees are in the desert. Both trees experience the heat of the sun. No one is escaping the problem of life. We can't. We can't say the reason that the, the tree that was bearing fruit is because God planted it in some jungle. No, they're both in the desert. Where there is dryness, there is, there is nothing. There is sun baking them. We can't say because God is shadowing them and somehow there's unique blessings over their life and that's why they're able to withstand. They're both experiencing pain and sufferings, the same. The difference is their root. The question that we should ask and step back from this text a little bit is why is the world broken? Why are we under heat? Why are all the people experiencing pains and suffering? Well, the answer is very clear, starting from Genesis that we've studied. Sin infects, infected the world that God created. It spread its wings and made all things bad. In Genesis 6, we read, The wickedness of man was great, and every attention of his heart was evil continuously. The precious creation turned from experiencing the blessing of the life and now because of sin, it's undergoing curses and sufferings of life. The peak of creation, mankind, rebelled and is doing wicked things. Nature has lost its flavor. It started to have bad things in it. Tornadoes, monsoons, tsunamis are making it problematic for people to live. Animals are a problem as well, eating everybody. People are a problem as well because it's in the human heart that sin has landed as the source of all wickedness here. Sin distorted our world and caused many problems. And we cannot escape it. That's the reality. As soon as you are born into this world, you experience difficulties, pains, and suffering. Paul Tripp puts it well in his book that you should purchase. You wake up each morning to brokenness. The frustration, decay, and pain you experience are not signs that you have been forgotten, forsaken, or singled out by God. They are normal for everyone who lives on this earth. Sin has frustrated the cosmos, and none of us will escape it. We live under trials and difficulties. Every single one of us. We have difficulties in our families. Every single one of us, even no matter how good you look on Facebook, you have problems. We have problems with our coworkers, our bosses. We have problems everywhere. There's emotional challenges with children, governmental problems, persecutions. Hopefully the law doesn't pass, right, that we're all voting for. So there are problems everywhere. We're all under heat. And so the reality is this. You cannot escape it. You cannot escape the heat in your life. And God is calling you to produce fruit in that heat, to be like Jesus. Some may say, well, it's easy for you to have peace and joy and love when you don't have that debilitating disease that's causing so many problems in my life. Some may say, well, you know, you're, you, can be so, um, you can be so happy because, and serve God because your child is not in sin and doing a lot of horrible things. Some may say, well, you have all things figured out at your job. You have a good job. 
but I'm trying to make a living here, and I'm suffering here, and I'm, I can't figure out my life. Yet if we look at the life of people, those are excuses. I understand that various people suffer various trials and difficulties, and some are, some are very difficult, especially physical difficulty. I work in the hospital, I know. But that does not excuse a person from not becoming like Christ, not growing and producing fruit, because we're all in some way under heat. Even the most wealthiest nation, America, and the most healthiest, hopefully, has many problems. People have financial problems, health problems, many issues. There are no excuses. We can't blame our circumstances for our actions. Because we are all broken. We are all in this broken world. Our goal is not to avoid the heat. Because we can't. Our goal is to live in the heat with Jesus Christ. Becoming like Him. To love when it is difficult to love. To exercise self-control when the lust of the world is like a magnet to our hearts. To have peace when the war is raging outside and inside of us. That's what God is calling us to do. Jesus teaches us to separate from sin and be trained in righteousness in our struggles. Change happens in the mess of life, not in perfection. You won't find a perfect boss. You won't find the perfect time. You won't find the perfect church. You are called to change and grow in Jesus Christ where you are. You should never think of the future. Well, whenever I'm becoming like that, then I'll really start doing this Christian thing. God is calling you to live now. Circumstances in our life are not the reason for us to say, you don't know where I'm what my situation is like. And yes, I don't. But there is someone that does. Jesus Christ came into this broken world. He experienced the pains and the sufferings of this life. And he never sinned. He lived among us. And he went on the cross and he took on the sins of mankind on himself. And he is on the cross suffering This is the only way for us to be saved, and we, the people, spit in his face, curse his name, and he, what is his response? He prays for them. He prays. In the midst of heat, in the midst of worst possible heat Jesus experienced on the cross, he prays for his people. He prays for us. So we need to keep that first part in mind. That we are a tree planted in the desert. That is where change happens. It will never get better. That's where change happens. Now change happens. To make the picture even more clear, the second point we see in the context is we have an idolatrous heart. If you, if you notice in Jeremiah verse 9, he all of a sudden just as if pauses verse 8 and says 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? He's pointing to the heart. In the context, we see that without the Lord, without trusting in Him, that's what Judah was doing, the tribe of Judah. Without His source, you produce thorns, not fruit. We as people in, in the heat of life, Our natural responses is thorns, meaning bitterness, frustration, irritation, anger, and more. Sin is something in us, and in a sinful world, we respond sinfully. The hardships in our lives do not make us respond sinfully. Rather, the hardships in our lives bring out our hearts and which is not really pretty. When someone steps on our foot, we get mad. Why? Because of our hearts, not because of the situation. When we get diagnosed with something bad, we lose desire to function and joy. Why? Because of our hearts, sinful hearts. When someone said something wrong about us, we are super defensive. Why? Because of our hearts. 
When our children are out of control and we get angry, why? Because of our hearts, because of our sinful hearts. Jesus says in Matthew 50, 19, this passage that everybody should know, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. We act sinfully because we are sinful. Our, our hearts are sinful. But it's important to make this emphasis here. As Christians, you know, how does this apply? Well, well usually we, we call this passage and we tell people, you know, uh, you need to repent, come to Jesus. But what does that say to Christians? Do Christians have a sinful heart? Do Christians sin from their heart? We know that Jesus gave us a new heart. He ripped the heart of stone, gave us the heart of flesh. Jesus it, we are sensitive to Jesus. Jesus freed us from sin. We are no longer slaves. Yet we also see various desires that come from our hearts that are contrary to God's desires. We see that our redeemed hearts, there are idols in our hearts. Actually, if you, if you remember 1 John 5, 21, which is the last verse of the whole book of 1 John, it's not a big book. He says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. And it's funny because he says this to little children, meaning believers, keep yourself from idols. That means there are idols somewhere, but in the whole context, in the whole book, he never mentions physical idols. He always talks about the heart, meaning our hearts, redeemed hearts, they are prone to wonder to things that is not God. To idols that don't satisfy. God keeps us, He holds us, He cleans us, He does everything, and yet we are oftentimes foolish and weak and run to things that don't satisfy. You know that famous song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing? There are these amazing words Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. We are set free, we are saved in Jesus Christ, and yet we still have an idolatrous heart that is oftentimes rebellious, that oftentimes is not thankful for the salvation, oftentimes finds satisfaction in things rather than the Creator. That's the heart that we have. In James Read chapter 4. He says, What causes quarrels and causes fights among you, which is to the church? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. There is a fight in our hearts. We oftentimes desire things that are ungodly. We follow it and commit sins. Yes, we are justified by faith in Christ, but also there is a process of change, which is called sanctification. It's a process that we actually become more like Jesus. Our hearts become more and more sensitive to Him. We still have a sinful tendencies in our flesh. We still have laziness. We still have lust problems. We still have all of that. Why is the devil able to trick us? Because we still have that capability. As, as we are saved, it's not like you're saved and, okay, I'm really good now. You're not. You're saved. Jesus cleansed you. You have the power of God in you. Now you can grow in him. But it's a process of change. It's a process of changing. Your heart needs to take away all the desires of the heart and bring in all the desires of the Lord. Our heart desires comfort, pleasure, satisfaction, which are not bad, but oftentimes we find them in things that is not God. So the reality is this. The second piece of the, of the map points our attention to this, this change is not a change of our behavior, but a change of our heart. We are battling in our heart 
We are changing in our heart. We are growing in our heart. And this is the engine of our journey. That's where the, the whole battle is at. If you read Pilgrim's Progress, you know, oftentimes we think it's a story of just him getting somewhere. But it's, it's actually the battle of the heart. He has various things that come into his heart and he battles and stands against them. Like doubt, unbelief, that's why they're all called like that, because it's the battle of the heart. We need to realize, knowing the first point, that difficulties don't cause the behavior, don't cause us to do bad things. Difficulties bring out heart responses to those situations. And, and as Paul Tripp emphasizes, in order for the tree to bear fruit, you don't focus on the fruit as much. You focus on the root. You focus on the source. The tree will never produce good fruit with the rotten, being rotten inside. You know, you never expect good fruit from a tree that's planted by a garbage place. You know, if it looks good, then there's a question. You should not eat it, right? you still automatically think, wait, this is a garbage place, it's a bad source, you know, where do these foods come from? Yet oftentimes we don't think about what was in our hearts for that action to come out. We blame the circumstances rather than we look for the cause of our hearts. We automatically connect the situation to our response. I yelled because of him. Or I lied because I had no choice. Or I became frustrated because it's impossible not to be frustrated. We connect it to the circumstances rather than saying, why did I become frustrated? What's in my heart? Why did I yell? What's in my heart? Because that's where the fight is on. Sometimes we as parents are tempted, and I don't know about everyone, but for sure, me, when you, when you uh, tempted to do what makes our children less rebellious, meaning if you gave them a wrong plate color and they're so angry about it, right? Or you told them to clean their room and they're so like, no, right? The tendency is like, okay, just give them a different plate color. Who cares? Or just clean the toys for him. But does that actually solve the problem? There is something in his heart that's rebelling that doesn't like authority, that doesn't want to be told. And just to change the circumstance doesn't change the person. You, you need to focus on the person. And that's why we sit in the bathroom, right, and talk and say, where did this come from? That's the same thing in our hearts. True change happens in our hearts. Circumstances bring out the idolatrous heart. So in our natural desire, thorns are produced in the times of heat, then how can we produce fruit? How can we produce love, patience, self-control? How can we grow in that in the fallen world with an idolatrous heart? It's a pretty difficult situation here. In other words, how do I change from the heart that produces thorns, which is us all, Christians, not just non-believers, Christians, and how do I go to a heart that produces fruit? And, and this passage has a clear answer. If we remember from verse 5 to 8, there's an emphasis on trusting the Lord. And in, in, in 7, verse 7, he says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its root by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. And is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Notice, fruit does not depend on the will of the tree. It's not like the tree is like, okay, now I'm going to just produce fruit. It's not dependent. No, our will is really strong, but in the heat, it is not. It doesn't stand a chance because it doesn't have a source. The source. In, of the tree produces the fruit. So that's where we get to the third point. We depend on the Redeemer. We depend on the Redeemer. The source of 
of this tree's fruit is God, Him, Redeemer, who works in our lives. Notice, in the midst of the desert, the one who trusts the Lord is the one that sends the root to the streams, and that's where the fruit comes. Christ is what gives us the strength and the power to withstand the heat of life and produce fruits. God is redeeming his people by the cross, which brings comfort, cleansing, and power, the ability to stand against sin. We are to trust the Lord to come to him so that our roots would come to to this power of change. In times of difficulty, we are able to produce good fruit. Why are some people able to be calm and joyful when, the li- when life is difficult? Why are some able to function well in stress? What can give us the ability to love and act wisely when it is difficult to love? It is not our willpower. It is not us making ourselves and maybe somehow training our brains and, and saying, okay, now I have to love. Now, okay, he's just a person. Where does this come from? Where does this source come from? The source comes from in Christ alone. And if, if you have a chance to open to John 15, that's where the main bulk of that idea comes from. John 15, verse 1. And I, I'm going to read five verses. And hear, hear what Jesus says about himself. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither are you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing." Jesus is that source of our strength. He's the source of change and strength for us. And and honestly, for Christians, that is one of the areas that we battle the most, is we believe that Jesus saves us in the past, and and we believe that he is preparing a place for us in the future, but we oftentimes don't believe that he's actually actively shaping us now in the present. Timothy Lane says a really good quote here in the same book that you have to purchase. Timothy Lane says, Christian hope is more than a redemptive system with practical principles that can change your life. The hope of every Christian is a person, the Redeemer Jesus Christ, He is the wisdom behind every biblical principle and power we need to live them out because Christ lives inside us today, because he rules all things for our sake and because he is presently putting all all enemies, all his enemies under his feet, we can live with courage and hope. Why do you think the Bible emphasizes a lot the emphasis, the, the point uh, the importance of spiritual disciplines for our life. Why, why is there an emphasis on reading your Bible, praying, having fellowship with believers? Even evangelism is a spiritual discipline. Why is that important? Because they all are like channels that bring us to Christ, and Christ is the source of that change. They themselves don't change us. Just because you read your Bible doesn't mean you're going to be changed. Just because you prayed a prayer doesn't make you more Christian. What does change you is that prayer connects you to Jesus. That Bible connects you to Jesus. That fellowship with believers connects you to Jesus because he says where there's two or three, that is where I am. That's the emphasis. That's why we're doing that. In the broken world with a sinful heart, we're able to be changed and to be shaped because of Christ when we are abiding in him. Jesus is the root of this tree. And when it is the root, no matter the circumstances, no matter the situation, we're able to produce fruit. If you know that passage in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, he says, chapter 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The emphasis of this passage, God saved you for good works, for you to live for him with his power, with his grace. And in order to make this map complete, there's a fourth element here. So not only do we live in a broken world, we have an idolatrous heart, and we depend on the Redeemer, but we actively grow in Christ's likeness. We actively grow in Christ's likeness. If you notice in verse 8, it's not an automatic thing, like you're by the, by the waters and you produce fruit. It's you're by the waters. Notice, he's like a tree planted by water that sends out its fruit by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for it remains, for its leaves remain green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. This is a process. We, when we are in Christ, we will produce fruit. Fruit is the person's new godly response to difficult situations resulting in God's work in his heart. Fruit will be there if the root will be in Christ. And the emphasis here is trusting the Lord. Notice in 2 Peter 1.3, there's this emphasis, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In Christ, we have all things to live a life of godliness. And yet, it's important to pause here and understand that Fruit does not just come by itself. Fruit does not just come out. We just sit there by the streams of water and maybe sleep there and we see fruits in our life. That's not how it works. There's a lot of effort on our part to have that fruit. Jen Wilkins recently posted on her, um, wherever she posted, uh, this in in interesting quote, and I, and my wife gave me that idea. Uh, while your justification costs you nothing, your sanctification will cost you everything. While your justification, your salvation costs you nothing, but in the process of sanctification, you have to plug in all your effort, every single bit of it. To produce fruit is effort on our part as well. But don't just sit around waiting for Jesus to come. Because there are forces at hand that deceive us, that want us to drink from other sources, that want us to do other things, and we are to actively cut them out, to get them out of our lives, and to reaffirm and restore the main source of our life, Jesus Christ. It's an active process. We actively are putting off sin and putting on righteousness, godliness, the tree needs to be nurtured. The tree needs to be cared for. The garden of the spiritual life needs to pull a lot of weeds out and plant a lot of seeds in. In Titus 2.11, there's this emphasis on training. Notice what he says. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. I actually have that slide. For the grace of God of, has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. The grace of God trains us. And notice, it doesn't say causes us. It doesn't just cause us to be godly and to fight sin. It trains us. And this emphasis is sweat and a gym, right? The, the word training is in Greek, gymnasium. And what do you do in the gym? Stare at yourself in the mirror? Some people do. But actively, what do you do in the gym? You, you train, you sweat, you pull those bars, you do those exercises, and you do it on and on and on, and then you see fruit. And that's what the grace of God does. It trains us to renounce ungodliness. It trains us to put away those things and trains us put, to put on self-control, to say no to ungodly desires. 
Why can't we see fruit? Well, because it takes time and effort. It's a process. To bear fruit takes discipline and spiritual disciplines. It's a process where we are active. God is doing his work, and we are actively like co-workers with him in this, in this work. So our main goal for this sermon was to give a bird's eye view of this picture, to understand what is going on in this process of change. What makes us change? Change and growth in a biblical context is a little bit more than just saying, just stop it. It's much more than that. To change, it's a whole process at work. We need to keep that in view as we are on this journey. So the first thing that we notice, we live in a broken world. As challenges come our way, we don't blame them for making us sin, but rather we stop and we realize, what does this situation say about my heart? What are my heart desires? What are the idolatries of my heart? Why am I reacting this way to the traffic or to someone who starts rumors about me? Why do I react like that? We, it needs to make us stop rather than connect and say, well, it's because of that. We need to stop and say, why? Because the brokenness brings that out. We have a sinful heart. We have an idolatrous heart. We realize that our natural responses are sinful. Because our our hearts desire to serve ourselves. Our sinful behaviors point to our hearts. We are to repent of that. We are to come to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith for his finished work on the cross. Realizing that we are his children, that this Holy Spirit lives in us. We need to realize the need for a redeemer in our life. And this is not just he saved us and we're good. He saved us and we need them even more to live our life. The grace of God is active in the past to forgive us, in the future to lead us to salvation, in the present to give us the necessary strength to do his will and to fight sin. We are to abide in Christ. He is our source and his motivation for our change and growth. And lastly, we are actively to grow in Christ's likeness. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.5.7 7 says these words, and I'll finish the sermon with, with this passage. For this very reason, make every effort, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Amen. Let's pray. Let's stand and pray. God, thank you for your glorious grace. Thank you for being our God. Let us realize what you are speaking to us in your word, how change is, is a bigger thing than oftentimes we take it, Lord. We are oftentimes shaped by the world and the way the world thinks, Lord. Teach us to think the way your word says, Lord, to realize that we are in a sinful, broken world, to realize we have an idolatrous heart and realize how much we need you, how much we are calling every person to you because you are the true redeemer. You are the one that saves and you are the one that changes us daily we need to come to you lord teach us lead us produce your work in us let us be active in our life to do that to connect to train to renounce ungodliness and to grow in godliness lord let your name be glorified let this truth be in our hearts and in our lives lord for your glory and the blessing of your people in jesus name i pray amen